Okay, cool. So what I did is I created a, um, a test on the left-hand side and um, a very simple mutex-based um, philosopher and fork implementation on the right here. I'm gonna make this a little bigger just so it's easy to read. Um, and then on the right here, I was doing a little research into um, various visualizations of the problem and explanations. This is like one of the best ones I found was the dining philosopher's problem with Ron Swanson. Um, the best part about this is that happy Ron and sad Ron are the exact same face. <laughs> I love that. It's just all you got to do is put some text at the bottom. So um, just to fill everyone in, um, let, you know, people present here, Ali, or people watching the recording, just to fill everyone in on um, what the problem is. Uh, it's this classic computer science problem that is explaining uh, resource contention when you have a number of um, parallel workers or concurrent workers that are trying to access shared resources. Um, so this can be like a process, a thread, um, a coroutine, um, something that is trying to access something that another uh, sibling uh, entity is trying to access as well. So in this problem here, it's being illustrated with Ron Swanson's. So the Ron Swanson's could be like threads um, trying to access a shared resource. And um, the shared resource in this case are the forks. There's five um, people at the table, five philosophers, and then there's five forks, a fork between each of the philosophers. Um, the issue is that the philosophers cannot eat unless they're holding both forks. So that's not possible. It's not possible for all philosophers to eat at the same time since you need to have 10 forks for five people. So there's a bit of a resource contention here. So if we can't um, share the forks, how do we coordinate this? And the coordinating, it's a bit complex. Like if you wanna come up with something that's really um, scalable, it, it's kind of hard to do. Um, so to illustrate this problem, um, I have a philosopher type over here and the philosopher um, has a left fork and a right fork and also an identification so that we can visualize um, who's doing what at one point in time when we run the test. The fork itself also has an ID so we know like where it is in the, the table, how to visualize it. And um, it has a mutex. So mutex is uh, an abbreviation for uh, mutual exclusion. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a primitive that makes sure that um, you control access to something in a mutual exclusive fashion, meaning that only one entity can have access to something at a time. When you have access to something, no one else does. So that's what a mutex does. So the fork is modeled after a mutex because once you grab the fork, only you can have that fork. Someone else can't take it until you put it back down. So the act of picking up the fork is acquiring a lock on the mutex. And then when you put down the fork, that is unlocking. So in uh, Go, actually let me pull up the docs for this just so we can um, see what we're talking about here. So down here at the bottom of the screen, I have the Go doc for um, the sync mutex. So you'll see here that it has two methods, lock and unlock. So typically what you do in a critical section in a program is, uh, and what I mean by critical section is a part of the program where you're accessing a shared resource. Um, you will lock first to signify that you have that mutual, um, mutually exclusive, um, mutually, mutually exclusive hold the lock to that critical area. And then when you're done, you unlock it. Quick so, question. Go for it. Um, so let's say 
someone else has locked this resource and I want to try and get access to it, what happens if I call lock on it when it's already locked? So what's going to happen is that your uh, Go routine is going to be blocked until the um, the lock is unreleased uh, released. So and this is not a deterministic thing. It's not like first in, first out. Just because you locked it before another philosopher tried to um, also acquire a lock, it doesn't mean that you're first in line. It's not deterministic behavior. It's up to the go runtime. Um, so what's going to happen is it's going to seem kind of random. Um, whoever the, the scheduler d decides should get the... Uh, um, the um should acquire the lock is going to get it so if we have two philosophers trying to acquire that lock at the same time while someone else already has it we don't know who's going to get that um okay. but yeah you'll be blocked until it happens so you're you're just sitting there doing nothing just twiddling your thumbs until um the runtime gives you control of the lock does that answer your question yeah Got it. Okay. Yeah. And this is kind of, um, this is a problem with some of the sync primitives is that let's say you're waiting for a lock and you decide, well, if I can't get the lock within a certain amount of time, I just want to cancel. Well, you can't do that because your thread is just blocked. Like you can't do anything uh -huh. else. So there's nicer solutions using channels and other primitives. Um, Cause like channels, you can actually choose like, either I wait for this or I can wait for this expiration time and then do that. So that's, that's another um, possibility. And I'll, I'll show an example of how that works. What, what's not so cool about um, mutexes. Like mutexes are really nice because they're simple. They're very easy to use, but they come with that, that minimalism comes with drawbacks essentially. Um, but it works great for a lot of programs. Like if you can write really simple programs where you don't need to worry about blocking yourself forever, creating a deadlock, then they're really nice to use because of how simple they are. Um, so the way that this works is that the philosopher is in a, uh, is initially in a hungry state and you can, you can tell that they're hungry by the drool coming out of their mouth right here. And uh, so what happens is first the philosopher tries to grab their left um, fork. And then we're going to print out a message. Philosopher um, has left fork of this ID. And uh, I'll show you what that looks like. So you can see here, philosopher zero got fork zero, got left fork zero. Um, whoops. And then philosopher zero got fork zero and fork one. So now they're eating chicken, right? That's what the little chicken sign is, is that they're eating. And then, um, they do some work. So we have simulated work here where the philosopher sleeps. Um, and then once the, the philosopher is done, the philosopher will put down the left fork and then put down the right fork and then proceed to thinking. So the philosopher is always going from being hungry to eating to thinking. It's going through these three different states, and it's supposed to um, it's supposed to simulate um, like you're waiting for some resource, and then once you've acquired that resource, you do some work with it, and then you're waiting for it again, or you're doing work without the resource. So you're going through these different states in our in our programs. Like a lot of times, if we have something that's like network I/O based, we're waiting for something to get transmitted over the network or maybe from a disk, um, or sometimes we're doing something CPU intensive where we're calculating something, we're crunching a bunch of numbers, and we're just kind of taking up some time to do that. So that's what these uh, sleeps are supposed to simulate. And um, the times here are um, not precise. Like um, they're all at the whim of when the scheduler hits that line of code and the scheduler runs go routines um, differently, like depending on when it gets to the point to where it can schedule something to run. So there's a lot of um, imprecise things going on here. Uh, 
indeterministic things going on because of the, the nature of the go runtime, the go scheduler. So yeah, we're just going through a number of loops where we're just trying to acquire the locks, left fork, right fork. We do some work, then we put it down and then repeat over and over again. Um, for the sake of the test, I didn't want to have too many logs being printed out. So uh, what I did is um, N is some small number like, uh, let's see here. I think we set N to three. Yeah, so it's just running three loops of what I just described. And uh, there's five philosophers. So we have a table made up of five philosophers. Um, we do a little setup here. All this is doing is really creating a circular array where um, each philosopher has the left, right fork. Um, and then the next philosopher, you know, we just switch, we just shift over. And so the right fork becomes the left fork and so on until you get to the last person who shares a fork with the first person. So it's just a circular array. We're basically implementing a circular table uh, using a slice. So that's what's going on over here. And then we're also starting all of the, um, the go routines for each philosopher, but we're not starting any work yet. We're doing a little bit of coordination just so that um, we have a higher likelihood of running into resource contention. So basically we don't wanna have each, um, since they're doing very little work, um, we don't wanna have each philosopher just do all of its cycles really quick and then get done before the next philosopher starts. We don't, we don't want that. We want them to be all queued up like at a race. We want them at a starting line. Um, so that's why we have this channel right here, start. You can think of this like, like a starter pistol. Um, we're, we're lining up all the philosophers and we're saying, don't start eating until I shoot this pistol. And that's what this line right here on 31 is doing. It's saying, um, I want you all to start once you see this signal. And they won't all see the signal at the exact same time, but it'll be a lot closer in time than um, if we were to start them immediately because the Go scheduler has a little bit of latency in setting up a Go routine and getting it started. Like there's some setup time involved. Um, if we uh, just wait on this, uh, this uh, channel signal, it'll be uh, relatively closer. And so we'll see uh, the kind of results we're looking for better. Um, another thing to note here is that we're using a sync um, primitive called a weight group. So this weight group is how we keep track of how many Go routines are currently running. Um, the goal is that we want all of the philosophers to eat and think and be hungry three times, right? So that means that this loop over here on the right-hand side, this loop needs to exit eventually. So the loop exits. Um, over here when this function is finished running, p.run. So what we want is to be notified when all of the philosophers have finished running. So the wait group, what it does is you, you increment a counter. You say, I have one more go routine. I have one more go routine. I have one more go routine. And then inside of each go routine, you say, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. So all the go routines, they tell you when they're done. And this is a, um, a, a concurrency safe thing that we can use to manipulate the same number between a bunch of different Go routines. And this is a common thing you'll see in Go for keeping track of um, all the Go routines that you're, you're waiting for. So we add all of the, um, we increment the counter for each uh, Go routine, and then we decrement it effectively by doing done. And then, hey Steve, how you doing? Good to see you. I'm doing well. Sorry, uh, I didn't mean to bother you. I just wanted to jump in. For no, no, no worries. This is, a, this is also a social call. So, you know, fear, feel free to just chat and say whatever. Um, jump in whenever you'd like. So um, we're just going over weight groups. So the weight group, you know, we're adding here. We're, we're um, subtracting here. And then finally, we're waiting for that count to equal zero at this point. And that's um, when we know that all the philosophers have finished running their, their loops. So 
Yeah, that's, uh, that's essentially the test. It's a pretty simple test. And that's kind of the problem is that it's too simple. It's, it's not going to work 100% of the time. It actually works some of the time. Because this is an indeterministic thing, sometimes we're just lucky and all the philosophers will be able to eat. So what I've done... So if, if there is a deadlock, will the test just like hang at the weak group dot weight? Yeah, they'll hang. Um, so there's a test timeout. Um, I think the default test timeout is something like maybe 10 minutes or something or five minutes. Uh, we can manipulate that too. Um, actually, let me pull that up just so that we don't have to wait too long. Um, what is that timeout? Hmm, I don't remember what it is. Okay, I'll just kill it manually. Uh, it's the minus timeout flag. And then in seconds. Timeout seconds, okay. So let's put 10 seconds. Let's see what, how that runs. Um, we got a fail. Did I put it in the wrong spot? Oh, it has to be 10 S, right? Yeah, there we go. So what it's going to do is um, when it gets to a test that's taking longer than 10 seconds, it's going to fail. And then it's going to give us a printout of what the go routines were doing at that point in time. Um, so we can see here that we have the um, sync runtime Semaphore, Acquire, Mutex um, is where a bunch of these were stuck. So we have, remember we have five philosophers, so we should have at least five go routines, one for each um, philosopher. And then we have some other go routines for uh, like running the test, uh, the main, um, let's see here, what else do we have? There's some other um, go routines that are put in there from the, the test infrastructure. So yeah, you can see where they're getting stuck. Like for example here, dining philosopher is getting stuck on line 29. So if we go back to line 29, uh, let's see here. It's trying to acquire a lock and it's just getting stuck. It's just sitting there and that's why the test froze. Um, let's see if there's- stuck Are they all spots. stuck on line? 29? I don't think so. Let's go take a look. Let's see here. So line 29, line 29. If I scroll up a little bit, line 29, 29. Yeah, so I guess they all picked up the left fork and they're all waiting for the right fork. Yeah, and that's what actually happens if you look at this um, illustration on the right here. Um, that's this deadlock right here. So in this deadlock, all of the uh, philosophers picked up the same fork and then they, they, are, they don't want to put it back down and try something else. Um, they're just kind of waiting for someone else and that never happens because they're all like-minded. So that's a problem. Um, we've got resource contention and we can't move forward. But some of the times, because the Go runtime is running things, you know, indeterministically, sometimes it does work. So I'll show you an example of that. Um, might have to run the test a few times. Yeah, here we go. So in this test case, everything actually worked. It just happened to be the right random values um, in time allowed it to happen. So here we have philosopher zero is hungry, philosopher two is hungry. Um, Philosopher two picks up fork number two. Philosopher three is still hungry. And you can see they, they're going through the motions here. Um, if you look at the fork numbers, this is the really important thing to look at. So like this is fork two, and then this is fork one, fork four. Um, you can see that the same forks are never picked up um, by the, the same fork isn't used by two different philosophers at the same time because the, the mutex is uh, preventing that from happening. So yeah, it just happened to work this time, but then on the following test run, it got stuck. So this is not a good program because it's working some of the time and the rest of the time the program just crashes. It just stops dead in its tracks. So 
the the question is how do we solve this problem um how do we coordinate the usage of these forks and the one of the simplest solutions to this problem well does anybody want to take a crack at it does anybody want to um, suggest anything before i just read one of the solutions any ideas so solution is that if you're using two forks, you need to pick up the lower numbered fork first. So what does that mean? That means that if you're um, the last person, you're gonna behave differently than everyone else because everyone else, the, the lower numbered fork is the one to their left, at least the way I've designed it in this program. So the lower number fork is to their left. And once you get to the last person, it's on their right. So you're basically making one person behave differently than all the others. And it works. It actually fixes the problem. Um, but it does so at a cost. And that's that it's actually slow because only one person is eating at a time now. You've, um, you've got all these, you've got five uh, philosophers you can have um, at least two of them um, eating um, simultaneously, right? Because we have five forks in order, um, the, 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 the next lowest even number is four. Each philosopher needs to have two forks. So you can have two people eating at a time. This solution only has one person eating at a time. So we're only ha at half our potential throughput here. Um, so yeah, that's essentially the problem. Now, how we actually implement this using the code that I've written, that's what we could try to do today, or we could try to experiment with some other things. Um, is there any questions here? Anything you wanna see done before I try to shoehorn in this solution? Yeah. So, let me uh, read that solution closely here. So you need to pick up the lowered number fork, lowered numbered fork first. So inside each fork is an ID. There's an integer. That integer is just incremented each time we place a fork between a philosopher. So what we need to do is instead of locking on um, left first, we first need to look at left and see is left the lower number or the, um, the higher number, right? So what we could do is, um, we need to have a low and a high fork. Right, and actually we don't have to do this inside the loop. We can do this outside the loop because this is never gonna change. So what I'll do here is um, we can have a low and high fork and um, let's see here, so we'll do if, um, if the philosopher's left fork ID is less than um, the right, then we'll set um, what we'll do is we'll set um, low to the uh, the left, right? And then we'll set high, um, whoops, it's not proper go syntax. Um, we'll set low to pm.l, and then the other one to pm.r. Um, otherwise, we'll do the, the opposite, right? We'll do high, low equals pm.l pm.r. Does that look correct? Did I uh, make any mistakes there? 
So then, and we could have also done this um, in the, the struct here, but I don't really want to change that right now, just in case uh, we want to go back to the old solution. Um, so now what we can do is uh, we can try to acquire the lock on the low first, right? So we're going to go down here instead of, we'll do that. Instead of this, we'll do that. And likewise, we're going to go over here. Instead of left, we're going to say the low unlock first. And then we're going to say the high. That makes Does sense. Does it matter what order you unlock them in? That's a good question. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I would imagine it does matter. Um, this solution doesn't say that it matters yet, but we'll, we'll find out in a second. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. So let's see what happens with that. Oh, and also we want to update our logging because um, we're putting the wrong values here. So instead of printing the left, we'll say low. And then over here, we'll have, uh, let's see, low.id and then um, high.id. Okay. So I think we've replaced left and right everywhere we can. So let's see what happens when we run that. So this is a thousand test iterations with the race detector turned on. So it did have a failure. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> test timed out after, oh, you know what? It was one test. Was it one test or? Uh... No, it ran many I, tests. I think, it, I think the timeout is not uh, per test. It's like for the, the whole, whole run. So okay. if um, like a thousand like a thousand runs will not be done in a second. Okay, let's try to turn this down then. We'll do, uh, oh, it's 10,000 runs, that's why. Uh, let's try to do um, 100 seconds for 100 tests. This should be done pretty quick. Let's see how that goes past. So yeah, this solution works. But the problem is, it's not as fast as it could have been, right? We could have, I think we could have finished close to twice as fast. Like if we're timing this, you know, it took us 2.37 seconds to run 100 iterations. We might have gotten down to, I don't know, a second or something. Maybe a little more than that, if we were able to get two philosophers eating at a time. So that's, um, that's the issue with the solution. It's really simple, gets the job done, but we're not taking advantage of our, our multiple cores. So what I'd like to do for next week is to get a, um, a problem set up for semaphores. And one of the nice things about Go is that we can actually use channels as semaphores. Um, we can use that to coordinate the various philosophers. So that's what I'll be getting done for next week. I wasn't able to get too much done for this week with my current workload. But um, I was hoping that this would be a good starting point just to kind of illustrate some of the, the sync primitives and get people exposed to the problem. Um, there's a number of different ways we can attack this. So we can, we can kind of try them all. Um, another good website for looking at this program, where was it? Coursera has um, some Go um, stuff on there. So if you want to do a Coursera class, um, that's a good place to get exposure to this. Um, the other one I was looking at was Geeks for Geeks. Um, they have some good write-ups on the problem and then they have some, um, I think it's pseudocode. Yeah, they have some pseudocode on how it works and then they have some C code at the bottom here. So 
there's a there's a lot of interesting stuff here on how to do it via um, semaphores. It's going to look quite a bit different on Go using channels. So that's what I'll be working on um, porting is getting a semaphore solution um, with uh, the philosopher problem. Um, does anybody have any questions about any of these problems? Anything anyone wants to share? Any go news or? Yeah, uh, I guess I can share the latest article I read from the Go post about error handling, which was quite nice. One thing that um, um, interested, interested me was uh, how you actually think of not exposing the error. So basically, you know, you can do sentinel checks, like create an error as a variable and then return that. But like people, like uh, they suggested not to do that because then that becomes part of your API for the package. I found that quite interesting. And like was looking at Uber's uh, recently uh, uh, uploaded uh, their code style guide and they have the same suggestion. Like don't do that, like create functions and stuff. Like for example, and the... OS package when find not found you usually do use the function as not exist function uh, so I found that quite interesting like not to make the error value as a um, part of the API but make a function or or use the new error wrapping syntax so this is actually recommended specifically when using the new wrapping it's not like a general uh, guideline uh, as a general guideline like, like uber does it as a general guideline and go said, okay, now with the wrapping, you can do it uh, much easier. Instead of having a function, you just do is and it will unwrap all, all itself. So, so with, the, uh, with the wrapping, you're exposing like an interface or a type, right? Because you're saying the error is this type or the error uh, is, uh, adheres to this interface, right? Yeah, uh, um, um, let me check uh, again because I don't remember by heart now how it was. Like I found it quite interesting. Um, yeah, so basically they're saying uh, use the function as well, like um, the OS function, for example. So the error does not become part of the API because if you want to change the error, Let's, for example, you want to change it, file not found to file does not exist, like, or rename it or something like that. Uh, you, that would be a breaking change if it's part of the API. So I found that quite interesting. That's cool. I'm really looking forward to um, having everyone just standardized on this. I thought people were standardized on Dave Cheney's um, package errors for the longest time, but yeah. a lot of people don't use it. A lot of people just return the error. Like they don't even yeah. wrap it a lot of times. Yes, uh, pretty much. Um, and like even I was looking at Uber's uh, documentation, like that uh, they said, for example, when you wrap an error, don't say failed to do, like fail to open file and then link the file. Because this is something I'm guilty of. Like I've did, I did that. And then like when the error bubbles up, it's going to be fail to do this, fail to do this. Like, it's gonna be a lot of failed words kind of thing. So they said like, try to think of uh, wrapping as like, just giving context, not like saying failed to do X, for example. So cannot open file and then the error kind of thing. So I found that quite interesting. And yes, I agree. Like, it seems like at first I thought everyone wanted to go do Dave Cheney and like even the Go team re were really impressed and wanted to do it, but uh, yeah. Like, like, for example, for the runner team, we do not use uh, the wrapping from Dave Cheney. Yeah, we don't use it on Giddily either. Um, we we just return a lot. And, you know, I, I think sometimes the, the wrapping, because when I used it at my old job, it was kind of used as a crutch because it had the, um, the ability to do uh, the stack traces where you mm -hmm. have all the places that it occurred, um, that it was wrapped in your code. And we use that to debug a lot of issues. But if you have really good testing, you shouldn't really be relying on stack traces a lot. Like if you have good testing yeah. and you have a good interface, you don't have to look at 
these really detailed stack traces because that's not going to scale in production like in production you don't want to be looking at a million stack traces yeah exactly and like yeah, yeah like uh, I, I think go like removed the stack traces like like on purpose because if you like create a java stack trace or a, a ruby stack trace like uh, me personally i don't get any value out of it just because it's so huge and so much information like you just look at the first few lines, try to understand what's going on and you ignore the rest kind of thing. Yeah, I think if your errors are, um, if there's enough rich information in yeah. the errors, that is enough for you to find out what the problem is. And if you don't have that richness in your errors, then relying on the stack trace is kind of leading you in the wrong direction because then you're yeah. going gonna to end up just using it as a crutch all the time. You can't, you can't, work without a stack trace, which is bad for when you want to actually deploy something into production. Yeah. Ali, what's the, what's the story for um, the errors in the, you're, you're working on the GitLab, um, what is the control? Um, GitLab TCL, GitLab T native tool. Yeah, do you have a, a specific um, error story on there right now? Um, I'm not, too familiar with what's going on there. I did see like errors got wrapped in a few places, but not everywhere. So yeah, like I guess I'm still learning about what the best practice is, but I kind of have a, a new question about errors that I came up before. Okay, you know how in Ruby there's like an error class? So like let's let's say I call a function and it's doing a bunch of stuff and like there's three different things that could go wrong and it's gonna return me an error. How do I know like which one of those three things went wrong without looking at the string? Because I feel like you shouldn't look at the string to determine that. And that's why Go113 is like really awesome because it, uh, it provides you that kind of stuff. So like, like Go's idea is all errors are values, right? So if, let's say your function is opening a file sending a request to a web server and writing to a file. So it can return three errors. So you would like have three error values. So for example, like a uh, file does not exist, uh, connection refused for the client, and um, for example, permission denied for writing the file. So you can check on the error type that's returned um, and like go one thirty. like before you had to use type casting or type assertions for that, but now with go one thirteen, you can use is and as function. Um, the, I'll leave it. Uh, I left a link on the Zoom chat that explains all this uh, using is and as, and like how you can like have a function return multiple error types and then check for those types. Uh, the, and go it's usually called sentinel error checking. Like you're checking the sentinel type of the error. That's the is is the sentinel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so Ali, that that that's why a lot of APIs work is they'll just have like at the package level they'll define a bunch of um, variables that are uh, predefined errors, and those errors they might be like oh uh, the network failed or the disk failed. And you would just check, you just check an equality. You just say, does my error equal this package error? And then you don't have to look at the string. You just have to do, do the, um, um, just the equality because it's a pointer. It's, it's got to be the exact same um, error. But the problem is when you want to wrap it and you're adding context, a lot of times what people will do is they'll create a whole new error and they just add strings together. And it's just, it's human readable but it's not programmatic. Like you can't manipulate that very easily in a Go program. So yeah, that's what this is does. If you want to wrap it, you can still wrap it, but you can get to the core. At the kernel of it is going to be the actual um, error. Um, so you can compare the actual value like we've always done previously, or you can actually look at the, the type of error. And all this stuff was like possible before. It's just that this makes it a lot easier and it kind of, um, it standardizes the, the practices. Like you could always use a, a, a type switch to look at what type an error was. 
And then you could say, oh, if it's this type of error, I want to do this kind of error handling. If it's this type, I'll do that. That's always possible because Go has a type switch. But now they have it in this like convenient function and they have like, if it doesn't match this, it has like consistent behavior. It reads more like English when you look at it. So there's a lot of nice things about this, but it, a lot of this stuff is still possible if you haven't adopted uh, Go.113 yet. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're still on uh, 112. I wonder how difficult it would be to upgrade. Uh, it shouldn't be too difficult. Like I, I imagine, uh, the cube, uh, the CLI is still like a fairly small project overall. So I don't think it yeah. would have any problems um, upgrading to one thirteen. Cool. Yeah, error handling is a great topic in Go because that's like one of the things that really stands out about Go is. Um, always checking your errors, you know, being very safe, like it's supposed to be a systems language. So, you know, we should be very cautious when we're building these systems. So I think it would be really worthwhile to have um, a series of problems just to practice error handling. And maybe we can do that after we wrap up this Dining Philosophers. We can look at how to use the new um, error API, like best practices, um, yeah, maybe even do some fun problems using errors, like kind of abuse them or something. That'd be kind of fun. Yeah, uh, like the only thing I hate about the 113 error handling right now is uh, you, you, like if you have like an error type, your own error type, so a struct that implements the error interface, it can, has the, it can have the unwrap method or the is method. So you have control over that. The only thing I hate is um, those interfaces basically are not exposed. They're like um, uh, anonymous interfaces in the error package. So it checks during runtime. When it, so you can't really know if someone, someone implements the is interface or someone implements the unwrap interface since it's not really exposed. And like, it does not feel like it's very discoverable. So that's one thing I, I don't like about the 113 error handling. I'll have to check that out. That's interesting. So you said that the the interface is not exported or? Uh, no, it's not because it's an anonymous, anonymous interface. So if you look at the source, co source code, basically you have an anonymous interface that's defined inside of the function that's, that has a NIST function and they do a type of search, making sure that your struct implements that interface, but that interface is not exposed to you. So it feels like Ruby magic. So if you have this magical um, um, method attached to it, it's gonna do stuff. But like, it's not really explicit or like clear to you that it has to be in the specific order since the interface is not exposed. So they need something like io.reader or io.writer just so that- Exactly, exactly. So yeah, just exactly something like that to make it more Go-ish in a way, because like it's all about interfaces in Go, right? So like right now it feels more uh, convention over anything else. I'll probably come, I'd imagine that would be next release. They would do something like that because yeah. they're kind of feeling it out, making sure everyone's happy. And then once they're happy, then they'll add in. A yeah, for sure. To unite everyone. Yeah, that seems to be their style. Nice and slow. <laughs> Anything else? Anything uh, anyone's interested in seeing with the uh, the Dining Philosophers next week? Um, something that piques your interest with uh, concurrency go routines? I'm going to try to keep the uh, the sessions with uh, less problems, just so that we have time like this to chat about whatever. Um, I spend a little too much time on the the previous progression, so um, it's Toby saying hi um so i think uh we'll just stick to maybe like one little problem and then we'll iterate on it and then next time whatever people are interested in seeing uh, whatever's the logical progression we'll uh work to that um, i'm gonna send this up to the repo and i'll share the uh the code in the um um in the go channel or in the slack channel um 
Yeah, I think this is a good stopping point. So thanks um, everyone for participating. I appreciate you all being here and I hope you uh, had fun with the Go Talk. Maybe we should change it to Go Talk just so that, you know, it's not, it doesn't scare people away for um, having to study or think too hard. You know, you can just come in here and chat about anything Go related and uh, get to know the GitLab Go community. That might be a good way to go about it to make it a little less formal. Um, Anyway, think about that and uh, good talking to you all. Have a good weekend. Have a good rest of your day. Um, hope to see you next week. See you. Thanks, Paul. Have a good weekend. Thanks. Bye.